Hello, and welcome to the third episode of The Scream, an art podcast where me, Holly, and my co-host, James, talk about the lives and works of artists. Today we have an exciting artist on our agenda to discuss, William Kentridge. William Kentridge is a South African artist known for his distinctive charcoal drawings, animated films, and theatrical productions. His works often explore themes of apartheid and colonialism, while being both visually striking and intellectually stimulating. And it's important to discuss the artist's background, as it has such a clear impact on his pieces. Kentridge, Kentridge was born in Johannesburg in 1955, during the height of apartheid in South Africa. Growing up in such a politically charged environment surely had an impact on his artistic development, as Kentridge's early exposure, as his early exposure to social injustice and racial segregation would go on to become central themes in his work. Yeah. Um, personally, I find, and forgive me if I butcher this, folks, Kovoet, Dreams of Europe, crafted in 1984 to be a particularly compelling piece by the artists. Um, actually, this piece was created as a part of his broader body of work, exploring the complexities of South Africa's people, um, sorry, history and its impact on its people. So the title refers to a notorious paramilitary unit employed by the South African government during the apartheid era. Um, this unit was primarily tasked with combating insurgency in Namibia during the second, uh, sorry, the, during the South African border war. Hence, this choice of title immediately sets the tone for Kentridge's exploration of violence, power, and memory. Additionally, Dreams of Europe suggests a longing or an aspiration for something beyond one's current reality. So in the context of South Africa, this could be interpreted as the desire for freedom, equality, or um, perhaps the mirage of a better life promised by the West. So by combining these elements in the title, Kentridge suggests that there is a complex interplay between the brutal realities of apartheid and the aspirations of its oppressed people. Formerly, Kentridge's drawings are often created using charcoal, a medium that allows for both bold expressive marks and subtle nuanced shading. Charcoal lends a raw visceral quality to the image, which I find to enhance the emotional impact of the artwork. I sound really formal saying that. Kentridge's <laughs> use of charcoal is particularly effective in conveying the harsh realities of apartheid, as well as the violence associated with it. Also, one of Kentridge's techniques, a hallmark of his style, if you will, is his, <laughs> <laughs> is his use of er- erasure techniques, where he draws and then partially or completely smudges or removes the charcoal marks. This process of layering and obscuring creates a sense of creates a sense. Of, creates a sense of depth and complexity in, his, in the imagery. It also serves as a metaphor for the selective nature of memory and history, highlighting the ways in which certain narratives are marginalised or erased. Another piece that we actually saw at the Royal Academy in 2022 is the Conservationist Ball, which is a triptych that uses darkly humorous image. Or, which uses darkly humorous imagery to critique the disconnect between social elites and the in- and environmental responsibility. Mm-hmm. While the title suggests a charitable event, the presence of wild animals like rhinos and hyenas alongside lounging figures in a sort of Europeanesque setting disrupts the scene. This creates a sense of unease, hinting at the enrichment of a threatened natural world on a seemingly unconcerned upper class. The artwork becomes a social commentary, suggesting that the elite's carefree lifestyle may contribute to the very environmental issues they claim to address. Mm-hmm. I... Uh, um, yes, I would say that the formal qual- qualities of the work help to heighten the unsettling atmosphere and social critique of the piece. So the triptych format itself creates a sense of unfolding narrative, urging the viewer to move from panel to panel um, and sort of piece the story together. Also, within each panel, the use of charcoal, pastel, and gouache creates a dynamic tension. And the charcoal's bold lines uh, establish figures in the setting, while the softer pastels and gouache add layers of detail and ambiguity. This layering reflects the complex and conflicting nature of the scene, a social gathering seemingly at odds with the looming threat to the natural world. Kentridge's mark-making is also noteworthy. The figures, though present, are often rendered with um, loose sketchy lines suggesting a sense of impermanence and disorientation. This stands in contrast to the more detailed rendering of the wild animals highlighting their bold presence within the um, artificiality of the ball. So I would definitely say that the formal qualities in the conservationist ball work together to create a um, visually unsettling experience mirroring the discomfort the artwork aims to evoke in the viewer. Definitely. I'd say though that it's also important to talk about one of his animated films. Kentridge's animated films are often grouped under the title Drawings for Projection, 
are a unique blend of charcoal drawing, stop motion animation, and social commentary. Created through the art artist's laborious process of drawing, erasing, and refilming each frame, the films possess a raw textured quality. And this technique, which Kentridge calls Stone Age animation, imbues the work with a sense of transformation and impermanence. A specific example of one of these works is Johannesburg, second greatest city after Paris, which is roughly eight minutes long and created in 1989. The film, the film revolves around two central characters, Soho Eckstein and Felix Teitelbaum. <laughs> okay. Eckstein, a stocky figure in a pinstripe suit, em embodies the ruthless and self-indulgent industrialist, while Teitelbaum serves as a more ambivalent counterpoint. They represent contrasting moral positions within the white South African population during apartheid. However, within the work, I would argue that Johannesburg itself becomes a character. Iconic landmarks like the Pond City Building are depicted alongside sprawling gold mines and townships. Right, and this creates a layered um, cityscape that reflects the city's economic disparity and its colonial history. And as well, the film's title, Johannesburg, Second Greatest City After Paris, drips with irony. Paris, a symbol of European grandeur, is juxtaposed with the developing Johannesburg, highlighting the city's <laughs> aspirations and struggles for recognition. So the film critiques the power dynamics of apartheid South Africa. And Eckstein's dominance and Tatelbaum's uh, anxieties represent the moral complexities faced by white citizens under a segregated system. All right, on that note, we hope you enjoyed this episode and that you have enjoyed learning about Kentridge as much as we enjoyed talking about him and examining him and his works. Don't forget to tune in to our next episode. Bye, Davis.